from the studios of Postscript Media and Canary Media. Mateo Jaramillo is the co-founder and CEO of the long-duration storage company Form Energy. Form has around 500 employees in California, Massachusetts, and Pennsylvania. Mateo has spent the last two decades building battery storage companies, with home base being California. But he just moved from Silicon Valley to the Rust Belt, and it's a sign of a new era for storage. And I was in San Francisco until last week, and now I live in Pittsburgh. And today I am talking to you from 84, Pennsylvania. So 84 is the name of the community? Uh, 84 is the name of the town, spelled out 84. And actually, uh, Form has our facility here for manufacturing. And the address is 4284 Drive, 84, Pennsylvania. <laughs> <laughs> that feels purposeful. <laughs> it does. Uh, you know, there's some divine plan here. Mateo's been working at the forefront of storage since the early 2000s. He got his start installing distributed lead-acid batteries in commercial locations for demand reduction. The technology was lacking, but he saw how valuable batteries could be for the grid in those early days. And then in 2009, he was hired by Tesla to build the company's powertrain business. And a few years later, he built Tesla's stationary lithium-ion storage division from the ground up. Today, Mateo's team is engineering very large batteries capable of storing 100 hours of electricity. So these are individual cells, so the equivalent of what you would hold in your hand with a AA battery or even a lithium-ion battery, for us is uh, is about a meter tall. It's about two-thirds of a meter wide and about 10 centimeters deep. And so it's a very large thing. And building many of those very large things requires a very large industrial site, which is why Form is constructing a manufacturing plant 30 miles west of Pittsburgh at a shuttered steel production facility in Weirton, West Virginia. At its peak, it was a site that produced uh, many millions of tons of of steel for the United States. In fact, I think during the World War II, it was the highest volume steel producing site in the country and employed about 14,000 people at its peak. It closed down in the early 2000s um, and it has lain fallow uh, since then, really. The location sits at the intersection of major highways, rail lines, and waterways. And it's also at the intersection of the old energy economy and the new energy economy. We've broken ground, we're, we're laying the foundation now, buildings getting uh, tilted up over the rest of this year, and that is where we will produce our iron air batteries at volume. Yeah, so what on earth does an energy storage company need with an old steel mill and the infrastructure surrounding it? <laughs> well, we, we are making uh, a type of battery which is based on iron and air, so we are reversibly rusting the iron as the electrochemical process inside of the battery, which which stores and gives off the electricity that we need. It also means that we're moving a lot of iron in uh, and very heavy things out. And so you think about sort of the core infrastructure that's needed to do that, uh, and it maps very nicely over the basically the steel infrastructure of the country, so all, along the freshwater system of, of the United States. And so we're reutilizing a lot of the core infrastructure there, rail lines on top of that as well. And part of the infrastructure is, of course, the human capital infrastructure and just the, the people that sort of know how to make things in heavy industrial environments. It's fantastic to be able to, to tap into the mindsets that have been around for generations here in the region. America is working to build back its industrial capacity, hopefully with a lot of clean energy. Armed with lessons from the past and a lot more government support, companies are planning $70 billion in new factories for electric cars, solar and wind components, and batteries, including very large batteries like the ones that Form is making. So this is infrastructure after all, whether it's highways or military or it's power infrastructure. So seeing what the government is doing today, it is quite broad-based, and there's a lot of things that are happening. This is The Carbon Copy. I'm Stephen Lacey. This week, I talk with Matteo Jaramillo about Form Energy's transition from an R&D and engineering company to a high-volume manufacturer. Is it a sign of what's to come for the U.S. industrial base? This podcast is brought to you by Core Power, an American manufacturer of battery cells for electric vehicles and stationary storage. Core Power founder and CEO Lindsey Gorrell is a former executive in the mining industry, and he's leveraging that experience to build a new battery supply chain in the U.S. Early on, I fully understood how reliant the United States was on parts of the world for the supply of these critical products needed to develop the green economy. My goal has always been to bring lithium battery manufacturing to the United States. Stay with us to the end of the show. We'll have an interview with Lindsey about how America can slash its dependence on imported critical minerals and batteries. America's green banks are preparing to unleash a wave of capital for clean energy. 
The Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund invests a historic $27 billion in projects nationwide. This could mobilize up to $150 billion of private capital for solar, storage, efficiency, and electrification in underserved communities. So how do we deploy those billions quickly, efficiently, and with the highest impact? On July 18th, Latitude Media and Banyan Infrastructure will host a virtual event exploring the -the on-the-ground realities of making America's green banks a success. Register for free by clicking the link in the show notes or go to latitudemedia.com slash events. Clean energy and climate tech are policy-driven industries, and anyone working in this field touches local, state, and federal policy in a very real way. And that's why you should be listening to Political Climate, a podcast from Latitude Media and Boundary Stone Partners that delivers an insider's view on climate policy and politics. Every other week, co-hosts Julia Piper, Emily Dominich, and Brandon Hurlbuck cover the nuances of government funding, regulations, backroom negotiations, and the election, of course. Political Climate is a show for people who want authentic conversations and strong opinions from voices across the political spectrum. Listen at latitudemedia.com or subscribe to the show anywhere you get your podcasts. In late June, President Biden was in Chicago outlining his economic theory, and he mentioned a certain company building a certain factory in West Virginia. We're in West Virginia. We're a steel mill closed in the beginning of this century. They had thousands of good-paying jobs that were lost. But today, with the help of the Inflation Reduction Act, a new plant's being built, building iron-air batteries, which are going to help store energy. And it's being built on the same exact site, bringing back 750 good-paying jobs, bringing back a sense of pride and hope for the future for all the people of Weirton and surrounding areas. That's Bidenomics. Form has also brought in the enthusiastic support of West Virginia Senator Joe Manchin. And the company has raised nearly a billion dollars from investors who are eager to back a company with the potential to change the market for batteries. And I wanted to catch up with Matteo as his company takes the leap into an industrial growth phase. Form has five co-founders. They've all worked in storage for a long time. And they all came together around the idea that the current technology paradigm is not sufficient for fully decarbonizing the grid. We saw what happened with lithium-ion, and we saw the progress that it is making, has made, and will continue to make. And and yet, we saw a very large opportunity still in the market, and that was to address something that lithium-ion just was not addressing, cannot address because of its costs. That something is longer duration. Now, there are grid-scale lithium-ion batteries that can discharge tens of megawatts for eight hours. But those are rare, and adding more hours can add prohibitive costs to a project. And on a grid that is now driven by weather as much as anything else, we need to start building storage projects that account for multi-day dips in renewable energy production, not just hours. That's what renewable power is, is weather-driven electric generation. And uh, there are multiple days of intermittencies associated with any of the types of those kinds of uh, generation, uh, wind, water, or solar. And so solving those becomes a a key uh, challenge for getting to a, a very deeply decarbonized electric system. You did it. You described it without saying the wind isn't always blowing and the sun isn't always shining. <laughs> I, I know. It's shocking, right? <laughs> I, I didn't even use that German word that people sometimes use. <laughs> uh, so that's really what put us in the space um, to identify that uh, kind of battery or kind of energy storage that would work. And um, and that allowed us to really understand that the characteristics of what iron air could be as a battery would solve that problem. So what exactly is an iron air battery? How do you get electrons from rust? It's a great uh, question, primarily because it's one that people naturally want to ask because we know a lot about iron. Everybody knows the iron rusts, right? (laughs) Uh, Humans have known this for a very long time. You know, you... You, you could probably rename the Iron Age the Rust Age because if you know anything about iron, you know that it rusts <laughs> uh, in the presence of, of water uh, or oxygen uh, and, uh, and some sort of electrolyte. And so, uh, so, so it's been a long uh, line of human learning around, around iron and what it does. And, and when iron is rusting, essentially what it's doing is giving up an electron, it's taking on oxygen and giving up an electron. Um, now, most of those electrons, of course, in rusting iron around the world is they're given up for free uh, and they never come back. Um, but uh, what is possible to do in the right set of conditions is to um, have that reaction uh, happen in a very controlled way and to reverse that reaction. So you start with a metallic iron anode, 
which is submersed in a, a, a very basic electrolyte. So there's salts in the electrolyte. And um, there are hydroxides in the electrolyte. And uh, on discharge, uh, what happens is that iron um, takes on uh, one of the hydroxides. So it goes from, from pure metallic iron, Fe, to FeOH. And, um, and that is the charge carrier for us. It's not iron moving around as an ion, like a lithium ion would, but rather it's a, a hydroxide ion that is moving around and shuttling the charge there. And so that hydroxide um, goes onto the iron and you have a larger molecule um, there. And that reaction is happening on the surface of the battery, but we have a very porous uh, anode. So that surface area is more than just sort of what you would see from the outside, right? And that's why we don't get sort of that flaky rusting Phenomenon that you that most people experience as rusting, right? Sort of, you know, you rub something and you then the rust comes off. Um, for us, that that is a reaction that's happening on a on a lot of surface area throughout the the, the porous anode itself. And then on charge, what we do is um, we essentially evolve oxygen out of the out of the air cathode. Um, so on on discharge, we're breathing in oxygen. That oxygen is creating the hydroxide. That's what's rusting it. And then we reverse that. We breathe out the oxygen on charge. Uh, and that hydroxide is coming off of the iron. So we're returning the the rusted iron anode back to its metallic state. So I listened to an interview you gave recently with Akshat Rathi of Bloomberg, and you said it's easy to build a terrible iron, uh, iron <laughs> air battery. It's harder to make that chemistry perform at the highest level. So what's the difference between a bad iron air battery and a commercially viable one? The difference is around efficiency, and it's around uh, manufacturability. In other words, can can you make this device uh, be a reliable, a, as highly efficient device as you possibly can make it, uh, and low cost as you possibly can make it? And uh, and so that's that's the main challenge, right? Do, how do you actually engineer something to perform the way that we need it to be engineered, as opposed to just sort of letting the reaction happen the way that it naturally, you know, is happening around us all the time, but very inefficiently and you know not very cost effectively, that kind of thing. You know, iron wants to rust, uh, and so in, in on Earth, essentially, harnessing that in the right way is is the challenging part, and that's what, what requires a lot of innovation and, and fantastic engineering. And and that's what I want to talk about a lot in this interview is the manufacturing component and what you need to do to scale uh, as you build this new factory. So you're working toward building these batteries at a very large scale. Um, and the factory underway in West Virginia will cost you know three quarters of a billion dollars to build. What are the technical challenges in that scale, and what leap in what will that leap in scale do to your costs? Yeah, so um, that three quarters of a billion dollars in, in the end that should deliver a factory that produces about five hundred megawatts per year, uh, which for us we, these are hundred hour rated duration batteries. So, um, so it can provide its rated power for hundred hours, uh, which means it's a fifty gigawatt hour per year. Uh, manufacturing facility. So on on par with all the other sort of lithium ion battery uh, factories that are getting built out there these days. Uh, but but the capex is much lower to go do that. And what that will produce in the end is um, cells at that scale that I mentioned, sort of those meter scale cells, and we will produce hundreds of thousands of them. Uh, getting to cost efficiency at scale means you you have to be very good at making the same thing uh, over and over and over again, uh, or you know the right variance of that same thing. And uh, so that's what we will do. That means that we can really dial in the process uh, and that we can really dial in the performance associated with the design that we have uh, settled on so far. And uh, you can really only do that in a, in a really stable manufacturing environment. And so building a factory is sort of what you have to do. You can't, you can't have, you know, we've learned this, we collectively in the power infrastructure industry have learned this uh, over and over again. You can't really get, cost efficiencies by having bespoke projects. They have to be uh, fairly standardized in the factory environment, in the manufacturing environment, to really drive costs down. The chemistry is very, very low cost, so it's less than a dollar per kilowatt hour for the active materials. The trick is building a device and delivering a system that keeps you as close to that entitled cost as possible. And for us, uh, that will be r- roughly $20 a kilowatt hour. We think we can go below that, but that that's sort of the first target that we've got. And um, And you can only do that if you uh, have an engineer product made in a stable manufacturing environment and then delivered out to the to the projects and installed very very easily. So so that's what what the manufacturing plant gets us. It gets us that environment to make that device to then deploy uh, in a in a very seamless fashion out in the world. 
And and the models for this, there, there are a lot of that. We're not we're not breaking any new ground in doing it. As I mentioned, we've learned this in the infrastructure industry for a long time. Uh, but solar is probably the most prominent example of of exactly that phenomenon of manufacturing scale and efficiency driving to low cost. And this is what you did at Tesla as well. So you you built the energy storage business at Tesla up from from the ground up, and you oversaw this period of immense scale from product development to uh, a commercial product. I, I'm just wondering, how do the technical challenges for this kind of battery, uh, how are they different when you're developing a product like this at scale? Well, uh, looking back at the Tesla challenge, it feels qu- quite straightforward now. <laughs> uh, we didn't have to worry about the chemistry. You know, what was inside the can of the of the cell is, it, you know, lithium ion cells. Uh, are, at Tesla are sort of inside what, what are known as cans, you know, the cylindrical cans. So what's inside the can at Tesla was fixed, and we didn't have to worry about that. Uh, it was it was great, uh, well performing, high performing, and and the work that had been done on the vehicle side also meant that essentially the module work, the collection of those cells, was was also quite stable. We didn't have to worry about what was inside the modules. We we took essentially automotive designed modules and put them into the right enclosures and put them into the right you know control systems and you know, thermal systems and that kind of thing. But uh, relatively speaking, it was a pretty short engineering putt, especially for a company like Tesla, which is phenomenal at engineering. <laughs> you know, that was, uh, that, that was you know, such a treat to work with, with, with that team um, on that project because uh, we had all the expertise in-house to do all of the work, the mechanical work, the thermal work, the power electronics work, all of it. It was just amazing. It's sort of categorically a different challenge at Form because we are developing the chemistry uh, at the same time that we're developing all those other systems, the thermal management systems and the control systems and you know the mechanical systems that that bring it all together. Um, so it, it has been quite different. In fact, the first few years of Form's life were just spent on the electrochemistry, trying to really understand it and characterize it. And we didn't really tip into the engineering of the product until a couple of years ago. Um, but we've been at this now for six years uh, as a company. And uh, so, so two very distinct phases, frankly, um, and we're tipping into the third very distinct phase. But we started as an R and D company. That's that's where we fleshed out the electrochemistry, the you know the basics of it. Uh, we became an engineering company. We're now five hundred strong engineering company, I would say, uh, with a core of R and D in there. And we are becoming a manufacturing company, uh, and that will be a, a, a new and distinct phase for us. It is already a new and distinct phase for us. Um, but but th- that challenge. Uh, from the beginning was was quite different from from what we did at Tesla. Yeah, I want to hear more about that. So you described these three phases, R&D, engineering to manufacturing. And your expectation when the company was founded that it would take a decade, perhaps more, to get to the manufacturing scale, and you are getting into that phase six, seven years in. What in the engineering part accelerated that phase? Were there happy accidents? Was it just execution? Like, what happened there that made you accelerate beyond what you thought you'd be at? Yeah, there. <laughs> anytime you start down a path as unknown as the one that we started down, inevitably there are moments when you you sort of turn over a card and it and it and it comes up your way or it doesn't. You know, the universe works the way you hope it might uh, or it does not. And um, the the few times that we've really truly had one of those binary moments, it, it's broken our way. Um, and so, you know, without getting into too many details there, you, you, you know, we didn't really know if you could, like I said, you could, we knew we could make a terrible iron air battery. <laughs> the question is, could we make a good enough one uh, at the cost points? And, you know, there were a couple of moments there along the way where we just, we just didn't know. And we had to marshal all the efforts of the company around a few really critical challenges that had to go get solved. And if they didn't get solved, we were either going to have to p- pivot or give all the money back or who knows what. But um, but it was very clear that those were fundamental binary yes or no challenges. And and when I say, you know, the Billion team knocked those down, that that's what they did. Now, they were extremely systematic about it and they're just, you know, phenomenally creative, intelligent people. Um, so it's not it's not as if it was just dumb luck that these things happened, but we just, you just don't know, right? And you can have amazing, talented, creative Intelligent, excellent people, and still the universe doesn't work the way you hope it does. Uh, so, so some of that, you know, it all interacts off of it. We also benefited not just sort of things coming out the way that we wanted it to, but also we we did uh, we we acquired a company early in pandemic, in fact, um, that had the technology that allowed us to really skip forward and accelerate the timeline, specifically for the air cathode. And so, um, you know, the, this air cathode is a very delicate piece of technology. Uh, imagine. 
sort of a, 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 a membrane, if you will, that allows oxygen to pass from the air and prevents liquid electrolyte from going back in the other direction, right? And holds that boundary layer successfully with current passing through it for, for 10 years. That's a, that's a tricky task uh, for any piece of technology. And um, we acquired a, a company called Fluidic Energy, later NAND Energy, which was a zinc air company. They had already spent 10 years and $100 million on just that air cathode side of things. And they were a little early in the market for that particular uh, technology, zinc air. Uh, but that specific component uh, it was and is amazing uh, and allowed us to really incorporate that directly into the iron air chemistry and to, and to really retire the risk associated with that particular line of development and, and really focus in on the iron side of things and the electrolyte and the way it all works together, but but not have to worry too much about that particular component. And if we hadn't had that, you know, might maybe it takes us a few more years, frankly, but it all worked out and we very happily have that as part of our technology stack now. On July 18th, join Latitude Media and Banyan Infrastructure as we take a deep dive into the next phase of deploying the $27 billion Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund. We'll provide practical insights for the state agencies and local lenders at the front lines of dispensing these funds. Where are the bottlenecks? How do we balance speed with transparency? And can America's green banks live up to the expectations of both local communities and Wall Street? Latitude Media Stephen Lacey, Banyan co-founder Amanda Lee, and Clean Energy Fund of Texas EVP Billy Briscoe will answer these questions and more on July 18th at 1 p.m. Eastern. This is a must-attend for project developers and financiers. Register for free at latitudemedia.com slash events or click the link in the show notes. I'm Julia Piper. I'm Brandon Hurlbut. And I'm Emily Dominich. A little over a year ago, political climate took a break so we could focus on the groundwork of implementing America's biggest ever climate bill, the Inflation Reduction Act. I'm excited to say, political climate is back. And I'll be joined by my two co-hosts to riff on the top political stories and insider scoops from state houses to the halls of Congress to regulatory agencies and even international climate talks. We'll explain how those developments are driving industry decisions today. Political Climate is a show for people who want authentic conversations. And to learn about how energy and climate policy is shaped within both political parties from the people who have actually helped shape it. So join me, Brandon, and Emily every other week, starting in April, for fresh episodes of Political Climate. Subscribe to the show wherever you listen to podcasts. So where is long-duration storage headed? Form has inked deals with Georgia Power, Excel Energy, and Great River Energy for projects that could replace coal or gas plants. Now, those projects have not been built yet. They're dependent on the build-out of manufacturing operations now underway. And to get those big customers, the company didn't just focus on the battery technology itself. Co-founder Marco Ferreira built an analytics tool for grid modeling, which helps prospective utility customers evaluate this new kind of infrastructure. It was a very high-fidelity view of the grid as it actually operates. In other words, minute by minute, uh, maybe hourly, hour by hour, sort of at the maximum. Um, But definitely not using averages for, for like an average week for an average season, for an average year, which is how a lot of modeling is done today to make plans about what the grid should look like in the future. And and so if you look at the way that the utility industry does it and has done it for a very long time, it is that averaged approach that they take to to try and forecast how to build this portfolio of assets to meet the growing demand that they're going to need. And if you average, no surprise, you sort of eliminate this understanding for these very non-standard types of events that are happening all the time now. And uh, and you also average away the variability and the reality, frankly, of how these weather-driven resources, wind, water, and solar, are actually operating, and then, therefore, the way that storage would operate on the grid. And so uh, we built, M- Marco and his team built those models. These are what are known as essentially capacity expansion or maybe production cost modeling tools done properly, again, sort of sub-hourly level details, uh, to, to get to the right outcomes. You do have to model it correctly to understand the value of these new kinds of assets. Uh, and what we have found with these utility partners that we're working with now and, and others is they have these same tools, and when they use the tools in the way that we use the tools that we built, they get the same results. Uh, but if you don't do it, then you don't get the same results. And, and so having modeling done correctly is really fundamental to building the right kind of grid going forward. If you don't model it correctly, you're not going to get to the right conclusions. You'll get the wrong answers, essentially, about what kind of grid you should build going forward. We're talking about how do you make the good decisions for building a lot of infrastructure, for plowing hundreds of billions of dollars into something. Let's make sure that those are based on the 
right tools uh, to, in order to make the right decisions. What are the specific applications that utilities need these batteries for? So you have a few contracts with uh, leading utilities. Your most recent one is with Georgia Power for a 1,500 megawatt hour project. And for context, that's more duration than every battery project deployed in 2019 in the U.S. Um, So why does Georgia Power need a battery for that duration? And what are utilities specifically requesting these batteries for? What do they want to replace? And what are their grid mixes look like that would require this kind of battery? Yeah, so in in one word, reliability. (laughs) That's really what it comes down to. Uh, And in two words, decarbonized reliability. And, um, you know, that there are many challenges that the electric system faces today. uh, And and one of those challenges is uh, meeting demand growth, frankly. Um, Right now, we see a massive push to electrification for all sorts of things, but uh, primarily uh, for transportation, of course, you know, the rise of electric vehicles, uh, as well as... um, the rise of electrification of industrial processes uh, because electricity is such a low-cost uh, source of power these days. And so so that is driving a lot of demand, frankly, for just growth in general. I was just at a conference not very long ago. A lot of it was on AI. Uh, and one of the main limiters for the growth of the AI industry today is electricity. They just can't get enough. It, and when you're limited by electricity, you know you're growing fast. <laughs> it's, it's sort of shocking. The other is just overall system reliability. Uh, so, so even if we weren't going very, very quickly in the electric system today, uh, there is a big transition that's happening. And uh, many uh, assets that used to provide reliability have been retired. I'm, here I'm referring to specifically coal. Uh, you know, We've retired roughly 200 gigawatts of coal in the last 20-ish years or so. Most of that has been replaced by natural gas. But that is not growing as fast as it probably needs to to sort of maintain the reliability levels of of the grid overall, and and you see this, you know, on the planning uh, radars of of all the organized markets that are out there. Right? MISO, which is the main uh, independent system operator in the Midwest organized wholesale market, you know, they have a whole work stream called the reliability imperative uh, because they see this coming, and you know, with increasingly volatile and frequent weather events. Uh, with demand growth, with a shift to weather-based power generation, keeping the lights on is a challenge. And keeping the lights on while we drive that energy transition is an is a increasing challenge. So for Georgia Power, for Excel Energy, which is another of our uh, big utility partners that, we, that we're working with, um, that's the primary reason. Uh, in their system, how do they maintain reliability? And increasingly, how do they m- maintain decarbonized reliability? And so it's all of these things that are now driving these utilities to to take some risk to look at new types of things, whereas previously they just didn't have to, or it was too risky for them to go do that. So the the paradigm has shifted, um, and I would say permanently so. So the Department of Energy is getting really serious about supporting frontier technologies like long-duration storage, hydrogen, carbon removal, and um, they put together these commercial pathways called liftoff reports that try to bring together talent inside national labs, forge manufacturing partnerships, assist in commercial deployment um, as part of this strategy. And and they say, the DOE says we need 460 gigawatts of long duration storage capacity to keep us on a net zero emissions pathway, which is a lot of storage. I mean, how much of a lift is that in the coming decades? And then what do you make of this government strategy? Yeah, so first of all, I mean, the, the um, work by the DOE on on this topic and broadly, I would say, recently has has been fantastic. You know, the term long duration storage is is one that's pretty broadly used. Um, so it's, so we do use that. We collectively use that term uh, to refer to everything from six hours of lithium ion to you know seasonal hydrogen storage. Um, so so I I like to parse that a little bit and say that what Form is doing is what we refer to as multi day storage specifically within within that sort of long duration you know big bucket. So. You know the way that we see the landscape um, playing out is you're going to you you'll need several different distinct types of long duration storage uh, almost certainly and and we're really targeting that multi day storage but but yes it is a very large market uh, broadly speaking and 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 the work to just even lay that out uh, is important you know there's there's an industry group also called the Long Duration Energy Storage Council the LDS Council and they're doing important work to sort of clarify these issues uh, as well and we are we're an active part of that. So that's, you know, just laying it out and, and sort of, again, back to the analytics, it's really important to be able to clearly establish the case for uh, these technologies as differentiated and, and providing high value into the system. 
anything at that scale that you're talking about, it doesn't matter what duration you're picking there for long duration, at that scale, you know, hundreds of gigawatts, th there's no <laughs> realm in which uh, having something that large uh, show up on the grid does not involve the government in some way. Uh, you know, that sort of doesn't, that's just not how things work. Um, so this is infrastructure after all, and the government is heavily involved in, in infrastructure. It's probably the right place for it to be involved, frankly, is in infrastructure, shared uh, commonly beneficial infrastructure, whether it's highways or it's military or it's power infrastructure. And so, um, so, so seeing what the government is doing today, you know, the, the Department of Energy Inflation Reduction Act uh, today is doing on, on uh, the, the electric system is, is incredibly important and it's certainly beneficial for form, but it, I would say even more so for the entire industry, uh, the power industry overall. Um, and so there's a lot of ways, of course, in which that support is being brought to bear um, in in the industry, and uh, you know these liftoff reports and you know focus on the on the long duration energy storage component of that um, is important, but it it is quite broad based, and there's a lot of things that are happening. And then the bipartisan infrastructure act and the inflation reduction act include incentives for uh, manufacturers and the build out of this infrastructure. What is most important for you under those laws, and what do you make of the effectiveness of these laws in establishing a real green industrial strategy in the United States, which is such a core piece of the Biden administration's clean energy policy. The Inflation Reduction Act, you know, is, is probably best understood as a industrial policy, frankly. Uh, and that is, is, you know, distilled down to a statement, we're going to make stuff in the United States again, <laughs> uh, especially for this uh, energy transition that that's already well underway and is global. And um, and so so what we see is uh, really, our customers uh, moving even more quickly uh, than what they had been planning before because of that bill and because of the support to, to manufacture things in the United States. So, um, so it, it is quite meaningful uh, for us. I would say for the broad-based uh, support for the build-out of manufacturing capacity in the United States and for the power infrastructure to move forward quickly to, to update all of it essentially, um, and the scale is is pretty staggering. You know, you mentioned the, the stats for long duration energy storage, you know, hundreds of gigawatts. That's, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars for just, you know, one type of energy storage in the system. And that's setting aside the generation side of it, right? The, the, the power uh, transmission side of it, um, the electrification on the industrial side of it. Uh, so there's, you know, it's really just a small fraction, frankly, of the total investment. It will be in the trillions of dollars uh, over the next couple of decades. And, and, and that's just a massive, massive wave uh, that, uh, you know, form hopefully will ride uh, for, for quite some time. In the coming years, do you think you'll feel more like a traditional steel industry executive or or like a <laughs> cutting-edge climate tech executive? Oh, or <laughs> Like, where do you think you'll okay. categorize yourself? Well, I hope, we, I hope we come up with a new category, frankly, um, and that, you know, the old paradigms are useful to, to learn from and to, to, you know, understand what's possible, but, but hopefully we also chart a new path. And we can sort of maybe break down some of the silos of thinking that that have gone into you know drawing these divisions between you know clean tech and old tech or you know old old industrial processes versus new ones, um, and uh, and some it, it can be a little confusing and mind bending sometimes to sort of you know build these new categories. Um, but what we have found is alliances with with folks who maybe we you wouldn't consider. Take Georgia Power for example. Um, you know they're. They are not what most would have considered to be a very forward-leaning utility, and here they are, you know, are, are one of our major um, partners, uh, leaning into to the technology and to um, and to the energy transition, broadly speaking. And same thing is true of the state of West Virginia. And I think part of it is understanding that energy is 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 and always has been and always will be important uh, for uh, the activities that we as humans uh, like to do and need to do. And so, as long as we're sort of oriented around energy as the unifier there, then then you can see these new technologies playing a really important role um, and bringing the communities along with it um, to, to sort of deliver on on what's possible uh, for, for all these folks. And, you know, I, I sometimes I try and get baited into a, you know, old old economy, you know, coal economy type, type my, you know, are, isn't that so bad? And I, I try and really resist that because I think, you know, take, take the city of West Virginia, it, it did everything that was asked of it. Right, uh, in terms of delivering the the power that built the steel factories that you know delivered the tanks, you know, and so on. That is the Secretary of 
uh, economic development for for West Virginia likes to sort of cite that litany. Uh, and it's true. And uh, what we need to do is make sure that uh, we're asking West Virginia to deliver again on on the next wave of energy uh, and, and to be there and to be a, be a part of it. And so I hope I hope that we do create a new category and we create it um, with folks that we're there with. Here's to new industrial categories. Mateo Jaramillo, the co-founder and CEO of Form Energy, thank you so much. Thanks very much, Stephen. Always good to talk to you. The Carbon Copy is a co-production of Postscript Media and Canary Media. This episode was produced and written by me. Uh, Sean Marquand is our engineer. Roy Campanella mixed the show. Original music came from Echo Finch and Blue Dot Sessions. Postscript Media is supported by Prelude Ventures. Prelude is a venture capital firm that partners with entrepreneurs across advanced energy, food and agriculture, transportation, logistics, advanced materials and manufacturing, and advanced computing. And you can help us out by sending a link to a colleague who you think would like the show and by giving us a rating on Apple or Spotify and send your thoughts on social media. I'm Stephen Lacey. This is The Carbon Copy. We'll catch you next time. The U.S. storage market is expanding quickly. Over the last five years, grid-scale storage has grown by almost 1,800%, according to Wood McKenzie. And battery electric vehicle sales are booming, with 55% growth in 2022. But there's a catch. Those batteries are overwhelmingly made overseas. It's great that we're investing a lot of money in EVs. That's fantastic. But I saw the evolution of technology coming to lithium batteries, green technology, EVs. And it was very clear that all that technology was somewhere else. Lindsay Gorrell is the founder and CEO of Core Power, an American maker of battery cells. Lindsay comes from the mining sector, so he knows the ins and outs of supply chains. That background for me has really made me understand of how do you get to the final thing, which is basically sustainability inside the United States. Core Power is constructing a 15 gigawatt hour battery cell facility in Arizona, which will serve a wide variety of battery markets. We're one of the only companies in the world that produces cells, fully integrated four-level software platform that is all integrated into our own controls to produce a top-tier energy storage solution. So by having all that technology, we can bring from the cells to the finished product to the market. I talked with Lindsay about the urgency of building up America's battery supply chain. The numbers are pretty stark in terms of dominance of supply chain outside of the United States. Uh, China accounts for, I think, around 85% of American lithium-ion battery imports. What's the current state of U.S. reliance on other countries for battery production? You hit it on the head. I mean, United States reliability on overseas supply chain and clean energy technology is is well documented. But what we really should be talking about is what are we doing to remedy that over-reliance? Because we are over, over <laughs> there's over-reliance right now across the board. We saw projects and supply chains took major steps back, you know, during COVID, right? And also the industry is just now getting back to where it was pre-pandemic. You know, we're wrapping up production in the United States, but also taking steps to ensure that new progress isn't slowed by geopolitical shifts or other unforeseen issues like a global pandemic. So the biggest issue is onshoring the supply chain. Right? That's the biggest hurdle to get past. One of the things we've done, and which has been is now public, is we've established sourcing partnerships like with companies like Novonics. So Novonics is a U.S. company and helped them augment and onshore the supply chain for battery cell and or technology. You know, one of the things you got to do is you got to have a cell. The cell manufacturing has to be in the United States to develop a supply chain because you have to have a customer. So we were able to basically support Novonics to build the anode plant in Tennessee that provides our supply chain to us, you know? And another thing is the real work toward establishing a proper supply chain and workforce is ramping up production in North America. So we're going to be operational in 2025, and we need a robust workforce. So not just the supply chain side of it, but you need a workforce. And we'll generate thousands of jobs in the Phoenix area. And we've we've been working with local colleges to create the next generation of clean energy workforce over the last two years. So we've been in this acute period where everyone has seen things uh, get messed up and it's exposed all sorts of vulnerabilities. Can you give some examples of how supply chain disruptions have been problematic, either across the economy or in energy specifically? 
Yeah, I think I think we saw we saw it all across the economy, right? I mean, simply put, you know, it creates kind of bottlenecks that constrain the entire domestic clean energy industry in our industry. If we want to deploy the amount of clean energy necessary to reach decarbonization goals, we really need to reevaluate and remedy the reliance on imported clean energy technology components. So, to do that is you have to onshore. So, onshoring the supply chain will unleash the potential of domestic manufacturing. You know, having done this, geopolitical shifts. Relationships between the U.S. government and other countries have less impact on domestic companies' ability to source the material needed for things like anodes, cathodes, insulate them from spikes in supply chain demands, pricing, shipping costs, et cetera, which, which invariably will create a supply chain to the, to the consumer at a reasonable price. It doesn't fluctuate by pricing pressures from outside sources, et cetera. Freight is one of the big ones that happened, obviously, through the pandemic, you know? You know, think about it this way. Simple put, if the EU puts plans into motion to phase out all fossil fuel vehicles, all OEM and EV manufacturers are suddenly competing with the same supply of materials. We are competing with the entire world. So unless you can localize your supply chain, or at least localize meaning maybe United States, North America, or somewhere close by, you have every, the whole world will affect you. I always say, you know, as a hockey player, you know, the United States is talking about winning the Stanley Cup, Right. But we are still just learning how to skate right, in this industry. So if you want to hit climate goals, you have to make your own batteries. So when do we get the stick handling skills then? Well, <laughs> <laughs> it's a focused five-year goal. If, you, if, the, if we focus five years on this, on the developing a supply chain, looking at cell technology, looking at building cells, we really can support ourselves. It's, it's all here, right? Again, Lindsey Gorrell is the founder and CEO of Core Power. To learn more about Core Power's investments in American industry and workers, go to corepower.com slash carbon copy. That's K-O-R-E power.com slash carbon copy.